Hello, hello, everyone. We are here for season one, episode two of Engineering Advice You Didn't Ask For. My name is Keir Hindoja. I'm playing host today. I'm an engineering manager at a private healthcare company based out of Toronto. Hello, everyone. I'm Louis. I'm an engineer. I recently quit to start my own thing. Previously, I ran a bunch of engineering teams in big tech. I'm Vic. I am a staff engineer at Eventbrite, and uh, I also run a couple software as a service things on the side. My name is Thiago. I also recently quit Big Tech for a mini retirement, and I actually got back into the Big Tech today again. So I'm back in business after three months of mini retirement. Congratulations, Thiago. Welcome back to the workforce. The perfect topic, a perfect segue. So today we are here to talk about the great resignation and changing jobs and when it makes sense to do. So let's get an opinion from all the experienced folks here. What are, let's say, the top reasons somebody changes their job? Or what's been your primary experience, either for yourself or your directs or your peers that you've seen as the primary motive for quitting their job? Something that's been really popular right now, just because of all the labor shortages that are happening in engineering, is just more people are leaving for getting just appreciated much better at their new roles. There's always things like interpersonal issues that they may have been dealing with and just putting up with for years. And now they're seeing that they are able to go elsewhere and just have a fresh start. The pandemic has opened up opportunities for people that previously were not able to work remotely, but now are able to find all these opportunities where companies all over the place are hiring just all across the country. Whereas previously you had to go in to a company in order to work for a big tech role, someone that lives in South Carolina is able to work for a Silicon Valley company. I was going to say that it became easy to interview since the pandemic started. The fact that you don't have to travel somewhere, the fact that you can do interviews in between meetings and still do a full day of work doing interviews, talking to recruiters and not having to go to a company to do the full round of interview is a big factor. I think another thing is the growth of salaries of total comps made it really transparent as never before. I don't think we, we ever talk about salaries. Five years ago, you would not be able to find how much a Google engineer was making, the levels and, and all that. Today is how public. So that is another thing. And the fact that there's so much more opportunity than, than they're able to feel in the industry now, it made super easy also. You have a lot more offers than ever before. Before, you don't have as many recruiters like sending messages on LinkedIn or whatever it is. Today, the market is really hot and there are more opportunities than engineers to be able to fulfill all those opportunities. But I think there are probably more, but I would say those are probably top three that I think. So if you look on average, between three and five million Americans have been quitting their job every month, starting from 2021, going through 2022. So twofold question. One, where can engineers find salary information that's most accurate? And is salary the only reason to quit a job? The, the two that I go to usually for salary information is I think Levels FYI is one I've heard of and Glassdoor. Again, both are voluntary. So take that info with a grain of salt. I don't think people have too much incentive to lie there. And even if they do, the averages are pretty accurate. So if there's a few outliers who are trying to lie or skew the numbers, they usually get averaged out. So between Glassdoor and Levels FYI, where I've gone to in the past, I am wondering if you guys have any resources to share with our audience and if salary is the primary reason to change your job. So basically, I think on the sort of latter question about salary being the only reason. I think a lot of people are changing their jobs because these companies have had bad cultures for years. They've had all sorts of issues that the pandemic has brought to the forefront. You know, you could see that because certain companies are losing a lot more people than others. And, and I think that's a big one. And then I think what Vic was trying to say earlier, basically, is that the pandemic introduced a ton of uncertainty. When people see all this uncertainty and they see that, look, I'm surviving this, I could survive a job change. I could survive a pay cut. I could survive moving to an island and work for a hundred thousand dollars less i saw people leave because basically they took a massive pay cut and they left and a lot of them and they moved somewhere totally different and that's the beauty i think of our industry it's exposed a lot of flaws in these companies and now these companies are basically their answer is to increase salaries and just try to not fix their culture and this is a disaster like long term this is a disaster for a number of reasons i think startups are going to pop up that are going to eat their lunch because they're losing their best people and, and a lot of those people are 
certain point where they said, look, I have a, a bunch of savings. And actually this pandemic just introduced a ton of uncertainty. I survived this uncertainty. I'm going to take this other uncertainty too. And so I think there's a whole lot of that going on right now. So I don't think it's necessarily just salaries. At least from what I saw when I was running my teams, it, it, was, the, it was definitely like the lagging thing. One more thing on, on, on this, when it comes to finding salary information, there's so much stuff online right now. And there, there's also this app called Blind that I'm sure that I don't know if people in here have heard people on there put their TC total comp. It's a very toxic place because it's anonymous user accounts and people are just very vulgar, very, it's supposed to be a professional social network, but really it's a, like a place to chit talk your company. But there is a lot of good salary info on there. So I'm just throwing that out there that if you feel a certain way, you should jump on there and ask the questions and people will chime in from your company and from other companies. I was actually going to also talk about blindly. The other thing I found that is that I found a lot of very useful threads on Twitter where people are very transparent about how their pay has changed over the years. And one of those was actually really instrumental for me to realize like how my pay compared to others in the industry at the same level. And I found that there are people that when you get close, you can straight up just ask them, what are you making? And it's not weird at all. It's especially not weird if they are not even in your company and people are more than happy to honestly answer that for you and tell you what their compensation structure breaks down into, help you with referrals and stuff like that. The other thing is people do move for salary, but I think at some point they start to look at increased comp as cherry on top because they've put up with something for so long that companies are not able to retain them by then matching their salary with a counteroffer because now it's a slap in the face. It's, oh, you waited to increase my salary until I quit. You mean you could have done this the whole time? That's not been great. Fully agree with what you said, Vic, especially the, the thing you said about talking to people and you don't ask necessarily how how much do you make? You you ask like how much people at your level make, right? Or what is the the, the top? 10% salary in your company. And you'll be surprised how much more information you can get in that way if you have a good network. And I would say Blind, Glassdoor, like all those sources you have to take with a grant of salt and you have to do the percentile to, to remove the outliers because there are many outliers there. And especially when it comes to equity, a lot of people don't put equity. Some people don't consider it bonus. There are people that put out in a single number. So you have to, to really distill that to really understand. But you have to do that across multiple websites and talking to multiple people to validate if you can. I think that would be the most reliable way. And the other thing about, okay, why would someone quit? I think salary is probably the most acceptable answer, especially if the salaries that you have seen. But underneath salary, there's probably something else. It's never only salary. I feel like maybe for some folks, but with the salary, with the total comp that we all have been paid in tech, independent if you're in big tech or not, you are probably already saving a big chunk of that, right? So it's, it's not that salary is going to make a huge difference. At least for me, when I started to pursue to interview for big tech, salary was the initial motivator, but then the, the challenge to crack the interview process and to prove myself and, and to go over it, that was probably the most interesting aspect and to see how reality was in those companies. Say something else again, because it's very similar to what you're saying. So that was me. So I recently changed jobs last May, actually, and I'd had my previous role for six years as the, the senior most I see at the company. I changed jobs for a very tiny increase in base count. And because that wasn't even the most important thing for me, I knew that I was going to this role and getting way better work-life balance. I knew that this was a company that offered parents so much parental leave that I knew that was the kind of culture that they were setting. So just that indicator was great for me to look at. And I got some RSCs as well. All of the other benefits, better medical, stuff like that, which is something that people often forget when they're looking at moving to a different company, a bigger company even, is that they look at the pay and they say, oh, you know, the pay is the same or pays a little bit more. But things like benefits just really opens up. Good point. There was a study done recently where it said your happiness is directly proportional to your salary till $75,000. After that, most of your basic needs are met. You have enough to live a comfortable lifestyle. And past 75000 it's all fluff, right? You, your job is a luxury at that point, right? So if you are deciding to go only after base salary, that may not be your primary motive to switch to a big tech company or, or, or somebody that's paying more. So a question that, that somebody had asked, if let's say you find another job that's paying hypothetically 20000 more, and if you go to your current employer to hand your two weeks notice, if they match that and 
with anything else like sign on bonus or RSUs, should you stick with your current employer or should you still make the plunge? What are your thoughts? One thing is that 75 case study has been totally debunked. It's BS basically. There, there's, there is diminishing returns as you go up for sure they found, but there's been subsequent studies that, that, that analyze that and 75 K man in 2022 with inflation at 7%, you can't even buy a Honda Civic. <laughs> but basically the, the price of a Honda Civic from 1990 to like the 2000s has gone up now and it's still going up. And so the point being that 75K is nothing and it's okay, but it's, but in our industry, they're paying a whole lot more. And so I do think if people are making 75K, they should absolutely leave basically. Like they should not stick around. But with that being said, I do have a rule of thumb. I don't think it's a good idea to leave for 10%. And I don't think it's a good idea to leave for even 15%. Hear me out. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, you've built up credibility where you are. If you happen to have a good manager, if you happen to have to be in a good team, I think those things are so much more important than a 10% raise because long-term for your career. But that being said, if you get a 50% raise or a hundred, it's a no brainer. You have to take that. Even if it's a shitty job, just to establish a new baseline. And I had this conversation with Gurgley on Twitter recently. He said, someone got a hundred percent raise and, and I was like, hundred percent. Who's going to say no to that? So even if you're making 75 K a hundred percent raise, believe me, they're going to quit. So my point is, I think you got to establish some baseline. And I think if you, you got to look at the stuff around you, if you happen to be in a really good team, the chances that it's going to be green are really low because that's just how our industry works. Unfortunately, most of the places are shitty and the likelihood is high that you're going to end up in a bad spot. Even in big tech, there's a lot of bad teams, there's a lot of bad managers. And if you happen to be fortunate, stick around. And then there's other options. Like you could transfer in the company before you, you sort of take that, that, that route. And when you transfer in the company, if you have a really good reputation, that reputation will still follow you because people know you and other people in other teams and other managers, it's easy to get promoted if you have that. So I would just say, you got to have a good baseline for the raise. And then one other thing on the previous question, I, I think one under rated way to find out how much people are making. There's all these postings. They have to be public postings of H1B sponsorships. And I, I know because I've filed a whole lot of those for people and we have to publicly list people's salaries, right? And, and most companies, most good fair companies are going to pay H1Bs exactly what they pay other people. And so when someone posts and an H1B in the US is basically a visa type to, to get your a, a residency. And so when someone gets sponsored, I forget the exact point when you have to post it, but they have to post it. And there's tons of them around if there's enough engineers. And then you could look, what is somebody making at this level? And that stuff is actually public. It's actually like in, in the government websites. You could go look there and look up your company and you could look up the levels and you could look up what they're paying for them. So that's a really powerful way to find out if you're underpaid. And oh, it's, sorry. Yeah. So, so where would you get this information? There's even an API for this. I've seen this. There you go. Vic, there we go. Vic will glue you, your engineers. <laughs> Just go into the API. One thing on that topic, Louis, the H1B and there's also the, the green card prevailing wages. I think they're also public. The one caveat there is that's only base salary. At least when I used to do it, it was only base salary. You would not consider the bonus it's or the equity. At least, so you have to take that in consideration. What, what can play a big factor? It can be the the hundred x <laughs> or hundred percent on top of that. I would just say if somebody goes into that and sees that their base salary is fifty percent or or twenty five percent, somebody the same level as them, they're underpaid. <laughs> and base salary is what matters the most. Exactly. 100%. Exactly. So anyway, no, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up. Two comments. One comment was on what Louis said. If you are in an environment, you have good work-life balance, you have a good manager, you're growing, you're learning, you're mentoring, it's going to be really hard to beat that if you move to a big tech. And I experienced that. Actually. I was on a big financial company and I was on a department that was amazing, that we had amazing culture, but you would not pay as much as the big techs. And I had this illusion in my head that moving to a big tech, I would be learning. The environment would be a hundred times better. Leadership would be amazing. And I burned out. It was shitty. It was like, and even though I get paid a hundred, hundred percent plus than what I was making there, my life became a nightmare. And was it worthwhile? Maybe because I, I didn't stay there long and I was able to, to make some money in between, but if I was playing for the long term, I would be much better off if I had stayed at my previous company because I had a lot of more goodwill. You build that over time and the more projects, the more people you have, it makes your life easier forever if you have that goodwill in the company and people trust you versus moving to a new company. You have to prove yourself again. You have to deliver those projects. You have to 
and it takes time to get at the same level again. So it's a big change. And the last question was about if you should accept a counter offer from your company, right? I would say that's a tricky one. There are people that are playing the game of, okay, I'm gonna interview and I get an offer so that I get a raise. They don't really wanna leave. I would say for that reason, that might be an effective but shitty way to do it. That can get you the 15, 20%, more than that is unlikely. But I would say if you do that, you're probably not going to stay long. If you got an offer and then the, the company gave you a counter offer and the main reason for you to stay was salary, is like the company knows it's going to be a matter of a couple of months for you to want to leave again. I would never consider taking a counter offer from my current company if I got offered from another company because to get an offer already went too far away. Eight or so years ago, one of my team leads actually went out and interviewed and got a really good offer and left. And when she left, HR called me in and all that, and they just want to go over her exit interview and all that. And as I was walking out of their office, I joked about pretty soon you'll be doing my exit interview. Total 100% joke. I had yet to interview. I hadn't planned on interviewing. I just knew that my team lead left for more money than I was making. About a day later, I got called back into the HR office and they gave me an extra 40 grand for me doing nothing. Okay. So the thing is, I had not planned to leave. And so I was just like, that's cool. And then I stayed another eight years because this was basically nothing. And the other thing I want to say is when Louis was talking about like 10%, 50%, all that, at some point, it's like a 10% raise for you might just be icing on the cake because you're leaving for other reasons. And at that point, if they had made me a counter offer, I would probably not have stayed because I would have been mad that they're making a counter offer after I'd already said I was leaving. Even an obscene amount of money would not have mattered. And I know people who have taken the counter offer. And then basically done the thing that you're talking about. Wait, they took the counter offer and they're like, well, this is great. But then they slowly got annoyed and they realized, oh, good. I have more money. I thought this would make me happy. But it turns out that the underlying things have not changed. I have more money and I'm still annoyed at all the things that I was annoyed by. I just have a little bit more money. And they ended up leaving anyway after two months or so. In, the, in terms of the company's eyes, would you... Like thinking about it from the point of the employer, if you could solve an attrition problem by throwing money at it, you would absolutely do it because it's cheaper than trying to hire someone from scratch. So you're like, uh, hell yes, I'm going to throw more money at it. Retention budgets are cheaper than, than trying to make systemic changes in your company. Just real quick, I've never made a counter offer to somebody that was leaving. Never. Not once. I'm against what? like it. Fill it. Principally, I will never make it because they're already out. If they want to leave, I've tried to get them to stay. And I've gotten people to stay, but not with a counter offer, but with the fact that, listen, if you stay and you do the kind of work, you're six months away from a promotion. You're six months away from earning more money than you're about to get over there. You want to go and reset the clock? Go. I'm not countering. That's my mindset. That's how I run it. And, and I'm telling you that's a better way. So I was, I was never saying before, just to be clear, I was never saying that people should be taking counter off. They should not take a new offer for 10 or 15% if they have a good team. It's just, they should stay at the old salary, go to the boss and say, the market is really strong right now. And just give hints. You don't even need to say that I have an offer. You just need to say that people making like 20, 30 grand more than me right now. I'm, I'm checking it out on all these sites. I looked it up on the H1B site. I look it up on the prevailing wages. It's all there. And, and I'm making so little. How do we fix this? Look at the work I'm doing. Look at what else I have on my plate that's coming up. That's going to be huge for this place. I think you have that conversation. They're going to get it. You're going to know, man, if we don't pay, he's going to leave. And so that's a way to do it. Once you go in there and, and you, you ask for a counter offer, then you're, it's like negotiating with terrorists. You're, forget, it. forget it. I think what you said about if you have a good team, that caveat is what it is, right? Because if you don't have a good team and you're trying to leave anyway, then neither of you is negotiating in good faith. If I come right. back to a team knowing that no matter what amount of money they offer me, I'm going to leave anyway, then I'm just going to use that as a counter offer back to the original offer, which is a good strategy. Let's be honest. I'm going to disagree with Louis on this one. 
if it's within reach, I would definitely go fight for that person, go to HR, go, go to my boss and try and retain them. Because the cost of finding a new person, getting them to ramp up, getting them to the same place of productivity is three months at least. So in my head, I'm weighing that against the cost of letting them go. And I've had directs in my one-on-one show me their LinkedIn and say, this is how much this company is offering. I haven't interviewed yet. Can you match this? Like straight up asking for a number. And this is base they're talking about, not even including the sign-on bonus or RSUs. So in this case, would you honor that or go his way? Okay, here's the door. Talk to you on your way out. So I was going to say that giving a counter offer and giving more money for someone to stay is a good solution for the short term, but a terrible solution for the long term, right? Yes, you can get them to stay a couple of more months, maybe six months a year, but the problem is much deeper. And another thing I would say is that if you as a manager, you are not detecting that someone is giving small signs that they are interviewing, they're unhappy. If you're not doing things, and as an engineer, if you're not giving hints to your manager that you're unhappy, if you're holding out that passive aggressive way that the manager doesn't know what's happening, that's where things build up to get to a point where it's almost irreversible. It's almost impossible. It's already too far. Something went really bad. It's okay, maybe the coach or maybe the manager is bad or maybe... There was something that was both sides of the equation were not aligned, right? Putting money there is not going to solve the deeper issue in most cases. What Vic said is, okay, when you are ahead of time and you give hints to your managers, look at the market. I'm happy here, but I'm seeing this. What can we do? Is there any more things that I can do to help the company, to help the team? And what can we do to get me there and put a plan together? It's not, can we match the salary tomorrow? That's not how it happened because the interview costs you a lot of hours. To get to that offer, you're going to have to work really hard for a couple of months. So the same to get a raise in your current job is not overnight. I think the main thing is if somebody's doing an amazing job and they come to me and they say they have an offer, I don't think there's necessarily something wrong with that. I think people should interview. They should see what they're worth. Companies like Netflix basically encourage people to go out there and get an offer and come back. And they're going to get a raise to that. If their raise is too low, and by the way, it's in his book, the the guy who founded Netflix, it's in his new book's amazing. Every engineer should read it. No rules, excellent book. They encourage in that company people to go out and get offers. So I'm not against somebody going and finding out that they're worth a lot more and coming back and telling me that. I would try to fix that as soon as humanly possible, but not right then and there. There's no way I can fix it right then and there. I will never make promises I can't keep, but I would be straight up and say, look, you are six months away from a promotion or three months if the cycle's coming up. And when that promo hits, I'm going to make sure that you're going to get more money than you have on this on this sheet of paper. It's going to be more than what you have right now. And if I know that I can pull that off, then I have no problem making that commitment. If I know that they're doing a great job, it's all about what Tiago said, like, what are the conversations? What's the relationship? If you and I have an amazing relationship, we've been transparent with each other. You come back and you say, look, I went, I tried, I got this offer. I can't believe they offered me so much. I'm underpaid. And you tell me, what should I do? I'm going to be honest with you. If you're getting 50% more, there's no way I can get you 50% more in the next promo. But I could get you 20%. I could, but not 50. That's impossible. Like HR would kill me. And so I have to be honest and say, go get the 50. You should go for it. And so when people would come to me and say, I got a 10% raise because of this honesty and then transparency and this back and forth. But it did happen to people in other teams that I had, that I was friends with, that we would go and have talks and I would be astounded. Like you're leaving for 10%. What are you kidding me? Like you you can get, you can move to my team and get 15, 20% more (laughs) in a few months. Why would you do that? You know, that's the kind of relationship I think you need to set up as a leader. So you don't have to make counter offers. I know it's expensive to hire new people. I actually agree with everything you said at that time <laughs> and say that if you have the kind of relationship with your manager where you're able to be honest about this and frame like everything else is going great here. I just want to be paid more equitably with the market. You are in a much different position than the people that will leave for any amount of money because they just cannot take how their job is currently treating them. We're now talking about a person that is having a good relationship with their manager, probably has a great relationship with their team. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I'm in a happy place and the only thing that I would like is a bit more money, I would definitely bring it back to my manager and say, what can you do? Do we have wiggle room here? Because everything is great. And I just don't want to be tempted into going off and getting another job. And it's a hot market. Managers understand that even if you don't have your open to opportunities badge on LinkedIn, you're still getting a million and some emails every single day. What advice do you have for not just new grads, but even individuals who are 
let's say a little more shy or introverted who don't know what the repercussions could be for having this kind of conversation with their manager there is fear and genuine fear if i go to tiago and say boss i want more money w- what if he starts using that against me in his behaviors towards me he starts giving me all his shitty projects he starts giving me all the chores that he doesn't want to do because he knows i am thinking of more money i'm a flight risk anyway why keep your head happy when i could go to louis or vic to keep them happy since they're more engaged they're more likely to stay how do you gauge that how do you assess that for an individual to make sure it doesn't backfire on them what advice do you have so i would say as a new grad but i think that applies to all levels you give first right you don't want to go on your first couple of months in the new company when you're still onboarding and bring that up you don't want to start that conversation you need to get to a good point in the relationship with your manager you need to be on a little bit of position of power to get that conversation in the table there is a lot of fear and a lot of times what i have seen are folks that are not doing great they have been getting feedback they know they have not been delivering as up to their level expectations and they bring that up and it almost puts more ammunition to the manager to, oh my gosh this person has no idea what's going on but if i would give advice would be you that reputation over time as for feedback and maybe try to have a plan for promotion asking how close you are from a promotion from the next level is usually a good indicator if you can or not have that salary conversation. It's not only promotion that matters, but I think it's a good proxy for you to know, okay, is this a good moment to bring the topic up? And of course, there is also like a timeout of staying in a position that you don't like. If you're years there, your manager is always making you feel that you are not productive and you know you're kind of productive, you know you're helping, then you, you should bring it up. But it is a really dedicated conversation to have, especially if you're starting in your career, starting in your company you need some time to to test the waters how you would approach this with your manager or let's say you you weren't as candid as you are able to be now if you were a little more reserved do you have suggestions on how you would tackle the conversation so currently you are able to go to your manager and 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 say okay i i love the culture i i love the extra vacation that i'm getting you guys are accommodating when i need time off for my kids but i know company xyz next door is paying 15% more if you are not okay bringing up the money conversation without fear of repercussions what What would you do to muster some courage or how would you ease that into a, a one-on-one that's a tough one right if you don't have the courage to do it how do you gain the courage to do it is basically the question i know it's challenging but i have seen people who are genuinely petrified of bringing up such topics with their manager you just drop a bomb like vic did it's a difficult question for me especially to answer because i've never been shy about that <laughs> And so I don't know how to put myself in a position if you're asking me to advise someone else I would just be like I would advise you to ask someone else this question. Yeah. So be as upfront and as candid as Vic does. It's difficult, right? Because if you don't actually have a counter offer, you can't bluff about this. If they call your bluff, that it's not going to end well for you. If you have not <laughs> actually had you don't have a job lined up, which is why people often even when they don't want to switch jobs, they go through the interview because they don't want to run that risk of having their bluff called and then have nowhere to go. So you do an interview, you try to find a different job, hopefully it's more money and then you bring it back and on the worst case, you go take this other job that pays a little bit more. But to touch on the question a little bit. I really do think if you're really worried about th- so there there's a number of ways to build up courage and we Chris and I have been learning this by writing online and forcing ourselves to put out forcing ourselves out there in the public everyone has different kinds of fears that's the first step so if you're a junior person and you've got a fear that you there might be some repercussions if you go in and you're asking for more money like Tiago said i mean if you're if you're just asking 3 months into the job maybe the manager is going to start looking at you weird it could happen but i would say this I would say you could build up your courage over time and there's a number of ways to do that. One, study the market, right? First of all, make sure that you have your stuff together and you're doing a great job, you're adding tons of value. If if you're doing that, if you're doing that, the risk is incredibly low. But then if you still have the fear after you know that you're doing a good job, your manager is telling you you're doing a good job, if you still have the fear to bring it up, I would say study the market. That's going to give you even if you don't go and get an offer, that's going to give you a lot of courage because you're going to see that okay, actually people with a year of experience now are making between 125 and 150,000 and I'm somewhere around 100. Now you know that even if you get fired <laughs> even if your manager hates you you have a few months first of all no one's going to fire you on the spot like I've also just I've never seen anyone pull the bluff I've never seen a manager be like you're fired you're asking for a raise <laughs> 
<laughs> it has never, ever happened. Okay. So that's out of the question. But I think if you've done your research, then you're going to have a lot of courage that even if there is some repercussion from that conversation, which is, it's like really unlike if you've done a great job, it's, I would say it's none, but basically just build up that courage, go study the market, figure out what you should be paid. We have a lot of good resources. Then I think from there, you could be a little bit more brave because worst case scenario, if your manager decides to slight you, you can, you can, you're going to go interview and you're going to figure this out. And in fact, if they slight you, that's going to give you even more motivation to go and get another job and go and get land something. Sort of along the same lines, I saw a, a thread from Tiago recently, which said, push yourself to change jobs every three years or so during the first 10 to 12 years of a career. And recently, my mentor gave me this advice to interview at least two times every year, whether or not you intend to take the job, both to find what you're worth in the market and to find out any glaring holes that you have in your skill set that you now need to ramp up on. So I just wanted to get everyone's thoughts on how often should you change jobs? And while you're thinking of that, is it easier to go vertically up in the same organization or is it sometimes required almost to go to another organization, get some experience and come back a level higher? I've seen that happen at, at multiple organizations and I always frowned upon it in, in the sense that if you aren't valued for your skill set and you need external validation for someone to, to acknowledge that and then you come back at a different level. I actually saw a meme or a joke about this a day or so ago about this cartoon. It's this comic strip where basically this person is talking about leaving the organization and coming back as a boomerang employee or whatever. And the reason they're stating is that because new applicants are getting paid more money than them and their manager tells them, well, that's because recruitment has a higher budget than retention. That's totally true in a lot of places. You're going to find that if you want to get promoted into a role, let's say that one of the biggest things that mistakes that you can make is getting an underlying when you hire because now you have to go through this whole promo process and your manager has to put together a promo package and all sorts of stuff for you to get into a, the role that you actually need to be in and you're going to find that it's easier to get that role elsewhere and then come back as that role later on if, if you find that you really like your company but you're underpaid or you're under level and and some organizations don't like that like microsoft for example you cannot come back at a different level than the one you're currently at for a whole year specifically to prevent this what you asked another question and i forgot what that so, was sorry yeah how often should you change jobs. I don't have an opinion on how often, so I'll defer to someone else for that part, but I will say that it's good to keep your muscles warm, right? So that the day that you need to change jobs, you're not suddenly going out there studying lead code or learning what it is to be a human in an interview and failing your behavioral test because you've just not practiced star format or whatever. So it's definitely useful to just do interviews every now and then, even if you have no intention. This week, for example, I got contacted by someone and I told them right away, I am not looking for anything. And he said, we can just chat. And I know he's going to still try to recruit me. And, it, but he's local. So I was like, I'll come get a coffee with you. But I want to state once again, for the record, that I am not looking, but I am interested in knowing how you do this thing that we do at our company. Two professionals talking to each other, two humans talking to each other. I could use to make another friend. I could use to just talk to another engineer about how they're doing stuff. That's how they uh, get you, Vic. That <laughs> cup of coffee. I'm not changing jobs. <laughs> so the thing about changing jobs, right? And you don't necessarily have to change companies to change jobs. That's one really subtle thing that I wrote on that thread is I see that there are maybe four dimensions or maybe more, but there are like big four dimensions in any job, in any company. The four dimensions are okay, the product that you're working, the, that means also the business domain, the kind of platform or the tech stack. It also the process, what kind of process are you using? and the people you're working with. So business and the product is one of the, the four dimensions and you can change a job and stay in the same company. And that's why I say every three years, every two to three years, it's healthy to change one of those pillars because it will push you to develop areas that if you stay too long in the same job, in the same company, with exactly the same constraints, you're going to be too comfortable. And then it's going to be really hard to do interviews every year, like once or twice a year. So it's almost to challenge yourself in so many ways. And especially, I would say, if it is the first 10 years of your career, doing that is healthy to build up your confidence. Because if you're able to do that enough times, you're able to get to new places and build up, learn new technologies, learn new domains, and you're still able to succeed them, then you're going to have that courage that you need to talk to your manager because you're not going to have the fear to change jobs. So I think that... 
He has multiple ripple effects in our career, but he's not changing companies. He's changing jobs. And I think that's, that's a really subtle thing. Just to tack on to that, basically, I think even a promotion is a job change, right? It's effectively a new role. I want to just touch on this a little bit. I think how often you should change jobs, how often you interview are two different things. Like Vic pointed out, it's a really good idea to build relationships with recruiters in other companies and all these places. Talk to them, get a coffee, other hiring managers. But even if you have no interest in leaving, just so you could brainstorm what they're building and how they're building it. And you could tell them what you're building. I've built so many great relationships that way. The last job I had, you know, I was at this startup called Jet and it got acquired by Walmart. Effectively, I ran the same team from Jet all the way up to Walmart. We, we changed our domain. We moved into pharmacy. But for me, I think the thing that is the deciding factor is how fast are you growing? How fast is the company growing? How fast is the team growing? How good is it? The thing about moving around prior to Jet, I actually moved around a bunch because I, I ended up in the big banks and I hated it there and, and all these other things. But basically, if you get into a good place, most of these companies are shitty. This is the truth. Most of this companies are shitty. Like they all have the same problems. I've been fortunate since I started putting myself out there to meet engineers like you all and met engineers in so many other places. And always you find out that they have the same problems over and over. Is it the companies that are shitty or managers that are shitty? It, managers can make and break the deal, right? Exactly. It's a combination of all of it. And, and basically it's just like a country, right? If you live in America, America is a pretty great place, but I grew up in the Bronx, New York City, and the Bronx is pretty rough. I grew up poor. And so you were around my neighborhood, you wouldn't think we were in America the way people think of America. And so my point is the same thing applies to companies. There are some places that are very whatever and some places that are rough. And that's the truth, right? And so if you happen to land in a place, I think that is a, a really good place and you're moving up, I think you need to just hit the gas, lean into it as hard as possible and just try to move to effectively like whatever your growth curve is and stay at that. So if you can keep getting promoted every year or two and you're growing into new roles, just like we talked about. I, I I want to say those are really good points about changing even getting a promo is like getting a new job you don't have to interview and go elsewhere to get a new job at my last job i was under the same corporate umbrella for 14 years even though my most recent role was only six years that's because i moved around a lot and i did a lot of different things i was i was a manager i was a director i performed whole different roles i went out and started new products and I think one of the reasons that people change jobs is because they grow stagnant in their role and they just get bored. Everything around you could be perfect, but you could be getting bored and you need to change a job because you've stopped growing. And when you realize that you've stopped growing and getting more money thrown your way is not going to feed your sense of boredom, you're going to need to change jobs. And whether that is to a different team or that's to become a different role, there's ICs that become managers. There's managers I've known who went back to being an IC because management just got too boring for them or it's not a thing they want to do. And of course, people go from being a, I'm a full stack engineer now and I want to see what SR is about like SREs seem to be having all the fun or whatever and people do this all the time so yeah great point there totally fantastic point love it love it thank you everyone this was such good candid discussion and such wide and varied perspectives I, I hope all of our listeners took something away from today's podcast if nothing else hope we motivated you to talk to your manager and have an honest conversation no matter what is on your mind if you need tips on one-on-ones go check out episode number one. We have a lot of tips and best practices in there. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone.